back. This is the second of the um, two that I'm do going to be, two videos that I've uh, produced tracing the roots, lineage and historical development of the Enneagram. And this, in this particular fairly short video, I want to talk about the development of the modern Enneagram and show how it links up to the roots um, in the previous um, video I did. There are three people who brought the Enneagram to the attention of the modern world. And originally it was Judge Gord, George Gurdjieff, a Greek Orthodox Christian mystic I, I've mentioned before. There's a bit of uncertainty about exactly when he was born. Um, and so it's 1877, could be, but it could be before that. And Ostra Chazo, Bolivian born Jesuit priest and philosopher. He, was, he died quite recently in 2020, and Claudio Naranjo, he was a Chilean-born psychiatrist, uh, spent much of his professional career working in the United States. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these three people. So George Ivanovich Gurdjieff was born somewhere between 1866 and 1877. As I said, the date is uncertain. In, and he was born in the border region between what today is Georgia and Armenia. Now, Gurdjieff was the son of a Greek father who was a bard and an, Ar an Armenian mother. It's interesting, it's interesting to note that Evagrius was also born in this area and is venerated there to this day. So, Gurdjieff grew up in a very multicultural region that had recently been captured from the Ottoman Empire um, by the Russians. Um, and, and there were um, Armenians, Russians, Caucasus, Greeks, Georgians, Turks, Kurds, Yazidis, all living there together. So though a Christian in the Greek Orthodox tradition, he was exposed to many different religious traditions and became fluent in a number of different languages. As a young man, he was trained both as a priest and physician, but he became disillusioned with the narrow orthodoxy of the Christianity he encountered as a youth. So he began to read scientific literature in Russian books. But having witnessed some phenomena he could not explain, he gradually became convinced that all of these different religious traditions had inherited some genuine ancient knowledge and wisdom in a much purer form. But this has been corrupted by religion and, and was certainly unknown to science. So he traveled very widely in Egypt, India and Tibet and Afghanistan seeking for the source of this much purer truth. Gurdjieff was never very open about um, the source of his teachings and the, the only account with, of his wanderings appears in the book Meetings with Remarkable Men and scholars consider it not to be an accurate record of events. Well, actually, that may be due to a number of things, um, certainly a bias against ex accepting miraculous healings as a possibility and the paranormal as a reality is one of them. But it's, it's very interesting to note that his account centers on nine people who had an impact on his life, starting with his father. In fact, I think it is more of a mythological account of his experiences than an actual historical um, account. Um, and the reasons I have for concluding that uh, it would take me too long. But having found what he thought was a major source of this ancient wisdom and knowledge, when he arrived in St. Petersburg, I think in 1914, he began to pass this knowledge on to a small group of, of students. And it was to this group of Gurdjieff that began, uh, that, that Gurdjieff began to talk about an ancient symbol called the Enneagram. A record of his teaching was kept by a journalist student of his called Peter Uspensky, and this was only published in a book called In Search of the Miraculous in 1949, two years after Uspensky's death and the same year in which Gurdjieff died in France. It is in this book that we first see the Enneagram symbol seen here on the photo. Uh, here's a photograph of the page on which it appears in my copy. Now, Gurdjieff taught that most of humanity is living in a kind of waking sleep. We're living in a kind of daydream, and that daydream is distorting our perceptions of everything and leads us to react to these, to these rather than acting in the light of what is true. 
Now, scientists who studied the brain waves during the normal waking life refer to it as the default mode network, the way the, uh, the brain operates during our waking dream. Rather con controversially, Gurdjieff used to deliberately trigger his students' habitual reactions to demonstrate the fact that they were functioning in a fixated and automatic way. They were acting like machines rather than free human beings. Of course, it was around this time that Sigmund Freud was developing the idea of, sub of subconscious defence mechanisms. Gurdjieff said it's possible to stop being a machine, but for that it is necessary, first of all, to know the machine. And when a machine knows itself, it is no longer a machine, at least not such a machine as it was before. It already begins to be responsible for its actions. So Gurdjieff would say, if we live our lives without waking up, it will be a wasted life. Um, having, he began teaching people about the whole possibility of waking and about presence, a key concept for Enneagram work, and he talked about, about the need to remember oneself. Now, translating this into modern psychological terms, we, we remember ourselves when our conscious mind is not being led by our subconscious mind or non-conscious mind or our shadow self, that which we hide from our conscious mind. Now to be present is to become the observer of all that's happening in you and in your body and what you're sensing, what your heart, in your heart, what you're feeling and in your mind through what you're thinking. It's to be in touch with your deeper and true self. Gurdjieff introduced the Enneagram not so much as a typology but as a symbol representing the universal laws which I'm going to be talking about uh, in the forthcoming Fourth Way Enneagram course in more detail. When the Bolshevik Revolution broke out in 1917, he moved with some of his students back to his hometown in Armenia and continued to teach, or at least in that area. I think it was around, um, uh, around the, the, the coast of the Black Sea, um, and you can find all the details of it in Uspensky's book. And then in, in 1922, Gurdjieff established his institute in France and he helped his students to experience the mystery and wisdom of the Enneagram through dance movements. These took place on a dance floor on which he had drawn the Enneagram symbol. And he said that the rhythm of these movements, which are a bit like, some of them like dervish dances, because you can tell there's an influence there, would suggest the necessary ideas and maintain the necessary tension without which it is not possible to feel what is most important. Now the rationale is that through these dance movements you become much more grounded in your body and you restore the balance of the three centers and he insisted you cannot do the work as he called it, this is the fourth way Enneagram work, without experiencing the energies of these movements. So um, I've got a video here as uh, I'll show a little bit of it. You can find videos of his dance movements online uh, in the YouTube videos, certainly. The Jesuit priest Oscar Echazo was born in Bolivia in 1931 
and he lived for a time in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, and other places in South America. Ichazo was applying Gurdjieff's ideas to a systematic exploration of different dimensions of consciousness that he was interested in, and the idea of the typology progressed from that. He was also interested in a wide variety of the ancient wisdom traditions. One of these was Kabbalah, the mystical stream of Judaism, and it was from this that he derived the essence qualities of the Enneagram types found in the modern Enneagram. Now, Jewish Kabbalah, although historically emerged, it emerged into the 12th and 13th century in Spain and southern France, from er, earlier forms of Jew, Judea, so Jewish mysticism, traditional practitioners believe its origins predate world religions in ancient Babylon and Egypt. One of the important symbols of Kabbalah is the Tree of Life. Now, the Tree of Life features in the second Genesis creation myth in Genesis 2 and 3, and it's actually an earlier form than the Genesis 1, and in the final chapter of the Bible as well, Revelation 21, and in other places. It also appears in ancient Egyptian cosmology as the symbol of the divine feminine energy. As in the mystical numerology of Pythagoras, the numbers 1 to 9 are significant, and so is the number 10, which symbolizes the cosmos as a whole. These ten spheres, or sephiroth, are incorporated in the mystical symbol of the Tree of Life. And each sephirah, the singular of sephiroth, can be described as a type of spiritual light, as the revelation of an aspect of the Creator. And they are the dom domains of divine consciousness. So the mystical stream of Judaism saw each human being, in essence, as a spark of light, emanating from one of these spheres. And so there would be nine of these. And the idea was that if you could discover which of the nine spheres of the divine consciousness you emanated from, it would show you your divine purpose in life. It would reveal to you your divine mission and help you to live in a way that is more aligned to God's plan for you. And, and by the way, the number 10 is the hub of the Enneagram circle, holding it all together like the spokes of a wheel. Ichazo also drew inspiration from the Neoplatonism of Plotinus, whom I mentioned before. Plotinus believed there was a relationship between the One, the Divine Source, the world of concepts and the physical world. He also taught that human beings had the capacity to come to a direct knowledge, or knowing rather, of these deeper realities and truths through a sense of beauty. There are three kinds of beauty that we can perceive, he said, physical beauty, moral beauty, and intellectual beauty. And these, Oscar Chazo, related to the three centers of intelligence that Gurdjieff described in, the, in his version of the Enneagram. The physical beauty of the moving center is seen when the body is moving in a balanced way, and this idea was eventually applied um, to the dance movements. Um, and then the moral beauty of the emotional center consists of nine virtues such as serenity, humility, veracity, courage and sobriety, etc. And the intellectual beauty of the intellectual center is found in the various holy ideas, which are various non-dual perspectives on reality. All the Enneagram types, no matter where their or what their Enneagram personality number is, have a virtue which is the higher emotion of their type and also a holy idea which is the higher way of thinking or perceiving reality thinking about or perceiving reality of their type now when we are in presence that is connected to the divine ground of being these qualities show up in contrast to the passions that dominate our responses to life and take us away from presence so Ichaza was the one who integrated the nine passions originally described by Evagrius with the Enneagram. Or... So how Ichaza arrived at the order in which these different passions and virtues are placed around the Enneagram is not clear to me, but I wonder if he could have had something to do with the order in which they are found in the Odyssey.
Now, I used to say that the typology of the Enneagram goes back to Evagrius Ponticus. However, I now believe there's evidence pointing to the possibility that it has far more ancient roots. And I was put onto this by reading um, Beatrice Chestnut's book, um, The Complete Enneagram. And uh, she talks about it a lot in her podcasts and other things as well. So the Odyssey is an epic poem attributed to Homer, who lived about 600 years before Christ before the Christian era, but most scholars believe that prior to what, whoever the final author was, the epic had been told and sung by bards for many centuries, so the wisdom of the Odyssey could be very ancient. The Odyssey portrays the obstacles that each of the Enneagram personality types has to overcome in order for them to come home to their true self. Now, I'm talking about this, I've got a completely separate um, video that I've, I've uh, recorded on the Odyssey, and you could look at that one separately. So he encounters these in exactly the order of the personality at types in the Enneagram, but he starts at nine and works back to the one from where he is able finally to go home. And in Enneagram terms, that's the central hub, which um, is the 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 the, play, the hub I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a myth, in the in, in, that's our sort of true self, if you like. The, uh, it's the divine center. So this is a myth in the original sense of the word. That is, it's a story about an archetypical inner journey that we all have to make in order to wake up and come home to our true self. And here it is important to understand that though we each sit in the domain as of a, a specific Enneagram type and subtype, to do the Enneagram work we need to work on the challenges of all types for we each have all types within us to one degree or other. So hence Odysseus represents us all. Echazo wanted to communicate these ancient ideas in a way that would make more sense to the modern Western mind. And C saw the Enneagram as a way to look at complete systems. This was also congruent with the way that Gurdjieff used it. But his contribution was to identify 108 different systems that he called Enneagons, much like the systems of ancient Egypt. The modern Enneagon, Enneagram movement is based on four of his Enneagons, namely the Enneagon of the passions, of the fixations, of the virtues and the holy ideas, which I have mentioned above. Claudio Naranjo is the final link in the chain, so to speak. It was he who developed the Enneagram of personality into the form which is used today. The accidental death of his only son in 1970 marked a turning point in his life. Naranjo set off on a six-month pilgrimage and a spiritual retreat in the desert near Arica in Chile, under the guidance of Oscar Echazo. Now, Naranjo, who was a a psychiatrist, I believe, adopted Ichazo's model and developed it further when he got back to the States. So people that I've, who, from whom I've learned the Enneagram, people like Russ Hudson, Helen Palmer, Jessica Dibb, Beatrice Chestnut and Uranio Pays, for example, were pupils of Naranjo's in his school, which he called Seekers After Truth. It was Claudio Naranjo who uh, developed the understanding of that each of the personality types with their passion, fixation, um, also had um, a, 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 an instinctual variant. So just as much as the, the, the passions of the heart center, the, the, um, the fixations of the head center, uh, were common that were, were found in all. So also, the instinctual variants of the body center were found in all types. And there are three instinctual variants. Uh, the three primary instincts being the self-preservation instinct, the social instinct, and the sexual instinct, which I mentioned I think possibly before. But um, 
the the subtypes are very important if you're going to go on to understand the Enneagram of the personality at all. And I just simply mention here, as a matter of the historical data, which I believe Naranjo's contribution to the the, the overall picture. So if one of your so one of your instincts will be dominant. Um, so for example, I am a social dominant five so and so is the shorthand for social so it's social um and i have a self-preservation instinct as my second and my sexual instinct is the third and uh, the one that um, i'm least aware of or least uh, active as it were as it were now each of the subtypes are quite different from each other so therefore without going into any detail at this point you'll have to discover that for yourself by listening particularly i think to podcasts of uranio sorry Ch beatrice Ches chestnut and uranio pace who will teach about this in detail but russell hudson also has teaching on this um so anyway um uh russ hudson both both the charles and, and naranjo died quite recently actually and russ Hudson started his Enneagram journey as one of the Gurdjieff groups in one of the Gurdjieff groups and one of his mentors was Madame de Salzman and she had been a pupil of Gurdjieff and was one of those who followed him to Armenia in 1917 and then to Paris where she continued his teachings after he died in 1949 and I myself have been uh, learning from people like Russ Hudson, uh, Beatrice Chestnut um, and um, Jessica Beard, Dib, Helen Palmer, etc. So I hope you found this helpful. Um, and I'm going to wind up now by simply concluding. Hello. Well, um, I hope you found all of that helpful and useful. Um, as I've mentioned, the course that I am due to be starting on May the 7th, this is 2023. Um, I, I, I'll give you the detail of where to look for this. You'll find it in the Edinburgh under the events page of the Edinburgh International Centre for Spirituality and Peace, and it starts on May the fourth, May the seventh, sorry, as the Sunday evening for one and a half hours from um, seven p.m. on uh, uh, British uh, British, um, yeah, it'll be British summer time by then. Um, so, if if you missed that, then um, I'm hoping to be able to make them available on another website, which I'm setting up as well. Um, but you can then um, contact me. So I, if you want to contact me at all, just leave a comment at the end of this, um, at the end of this video, and I can send you links to stuff if I've got them available or send you the, the, the videos, um, separate videos. Okay.